Hello and welcome to JSB Talks Digital, the podcast for marketers, bloggers, business owners, and those of you bringing your skills into the digital age. I'm Joanne Sweeney Burke, and this podcast is brought to you by Digital Training Institute. Coming up in today's show, which is dedicated to video marketing, in social media news, add captions to your Facebook videos, go live on Facebook from your desktop, Twitter shuts down the Twitter dashboard app. I interview YouTube sensation Roberto Blake. Shoutouts to YouTubers rocking the social media world. JSB's column, My Vlogging Story. And find out what video marketing tool saved my working week. Social Media News. Did you know you can now easily add captions to your native Facebook videos? Video captions on Facebook are important, particularly on ads, because Facebook videos autoplay without sound. The lack of audio reduces an advertiser's capacity to grab attention in the newsfeed. And with research showing that 47% of the value in a video campaign is delivered in the first three seconds, any reduction in potential impact is significant. Facebook's own research shows that 41% of videos are meaningless without sound, so you need to add captions and it's simple to do. To access captions on your Facebook page, go to the Publishing Tools tab, then select Video Library in the left sidebar. Once there, you will see a listing of all your videos, hover over any video and you'll get an edit video prompt. It's a good idea to go back on old videos and add captions. I am so thrilled to see Facebook give us the option to go live directly from desktop. Previous to this, we had to use third-party software such as OBS Studio, which was a little technical for some of us. Facebook said on its blog that it wanted to give publishers more control, customization, and flexibility over their broadcasts. As a new vlogger, I am excited that Facebook is rolling out the ability to go live on Facebook via a web browser to pages. As Facebook states, a variety of broadcast types like daily vlogs benefit from an easy, stable camera setup and bringing live to laptops and desktops will make this style of broadcasting easier. So my friends, great news for JSB Talks Digital, the vlog. Twitter announced on Twitter recently that it's shutting down the dashboard app on February 3rd. I wrote a blog post about how to use Twitter dashboard in July, which was aimed at small business owners to manage all aspects of their Twitter marketing activities. However, it's not all bad news. Twitter says it hopes to bring the best features from dashboard to the broader Twitter community in the future. So let's see if and when that happens. For now, business owners can manage and schedule tweets in TweetDeck. Interview. In this week's show, I'm delighted to be joined by YouTube hero and master Roberto Blake. Roberto is a creative entrepreneur helping individuals and businesses develop engaging brand and content. He's got a background in both design and marketing, which have allowed him to help his clients with visual branding, as well as creating content and messaging that converts. More recently, he has developed a popular YouTube channel and has built a community around his content of over 186,000 subscribers. Roberto, thank you so much for joining me on JSB Talks Digital. Thanks so much for having me. So first of all, tell our listeners how you got into video marketing and what prompted your YouTube career. Well, with video marketing and YouTube, everything for me comes down to being a practitioner. So it's about actually you know, doing the thing before you try to talk to anybody about doing the thing, right? Everybody starts at zero. I got into YouTube more than anything to create uh, tutorials and give advice that I wish I'd gotten. Um, I can't go back in time and help a younger Roberto. So I'd ideally like to think that... Uh, my content is helping other creative people that are looking for information and don't have someone to turn to. Now, when we think about video marketing, I know when I'm talking to, to my clients and even peers in my industry, the one thing that they say is, oh, video was so time consuming. 
but you in fact have a daily video schedule. How much time per week do you spend creating content? Less than people would imagine. I probably only spend 30 hours a month or, uh, in total, maybe, um, and that might change. And that's operating solo doing that. That part of what I do, I'm doing solo until later this year. I'm actually hiring some assistant editors. That way we can try to ramp up the schedule to try to get almost two videos a day out because I think that that's what's going to take everything to the next level. I kind of got into a little bit of that, I think maybe two to three years ago as a, a case study, if nothing else. I wanted to see what it would take to make daily videos practical, especially videos that are education-based. So it's not like daily vloggers. It's not like life casters who just you know walk around and pull out their camera all day and talk to it. My stuff is informational. It's like it's fun and informative, uh, and my topics usually center, as you know, around creative subjects like design, photography, uh, video creation, art, etc. But they also are coming from the perspective of well, what does it take to have a career in this, or what are tools you need, uh, what tech and gear do you need, what do you buy, uh, what to expect from clients, things like that. So the videos that I do are typically anywhere from 5 to 12 minutes. Some of them go longer. And so that's not the same thing as just, oh, I'm going to get on camera, I'm just going to share my thoughts or tell you about my day or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with those things. I'm just pointing out that if you're doing intentional information or education-based content and you have a set-up format for it, you can make it very easy if you're a business. And I wanted to prove that and get businesses, you know, so many people, you've talked to people about video marketing, the idea of even putting out one video a week overwhelms them. It just completely overwhelms them and they, they can't seem to do it or be consistent and get it out. If I only had to do one video per week, I could not only get it out every single time, I could probably release them all at like 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every single Wednesday or something if I was going to do that. So, but I got there by making it practical. I got there by doing up to this point about a thousand videos. I, I, my thing is I shoot back to back to back. I batch the content. I know what I'm going to say. I'm only speaking on things that I have experience in. And so for me, I don't have to write a script. I don't have to do a lot of involved research. I don't have to do a major setup. I leave my gear and my lights pretty much standing all the time and then just rearrange things based on which uh, set I want to use, whether it's my bookshelf or whether it's my work desk. And when I'm filming in the real world, I just do everything to make it practical and easy. So that would kind of be my advice to anyone who's feeling overwhelmed by this is build yourself a system, figure out what it would take to do as much video as you want to do. And if you're going to start with one video a week, set aside an hour or two and just film all four or five of the videos, change your clothing if you need to, if that's your thing, and just go with it. So would you attribute that consistency and that process and the frequency of delivering a video every day to building up over 180,000 subscribers? How long did that take you, Roberto? Well, I started um, taking YouTube seriously in July of 2013. My account I made in 2009, but when everyone makes a YouTube account, no one ever does anything with it other than comment on other people's videos or upload a video twice a year. And I did that just like anybody else. So you can not you can say my account is from 2009, but that's not when I actually really did anything with YouTube. I didn't start until July of 2013 is when I started doing at least one upload a week. And I don't think until you're doing that, unless you're a filmmaker or an animator or somebody doing very, very high produced content, if you're not doing that kind of high produced content that takes weeks of editing, then you can't say that you're a YouTuber or that you're doing YouTube until you're putting out content every week. So for me, that started in July of 2013. I started from zero just like anyone else. No one was really watching my channel. I didn't have thousands of subscribers. I don't even think I had 100. And so I started there, and I built that up over time. And the thing is, what I do is very specialized, and I do a diverse amount of uh, content and subjects. Niche channels, channels that focus only on one thing, tend to perform better. 
My channel is a community channel, and it's a library. Most YouTube channels, as you know, will try to be the blockbuster movie weekend. They'll try to release one or two really good videos in um, a week that all of their subscribers can or would watch because it only focuses on one thing, whether it's tech or gaming or books or um, social media, whatever it is. That's what's called a niche, and that's what you call a narrow niche where you stay in one lane only, and that's all you talk about. Maybe it's photography. You know, maybe it's beauty and makeup or fashion. You know, you know channels like that. They're going to get a lot of views because all their subscribers subscribe for one thing. Part of the problem with that, though, is they could also get easily bored or maybe their subscribers care about things that are related to that. But YouTube and the algorithm and things like that kind of encourage um, creators to kind of stay in this one lane thing. And what it means is people, once they find success, they don't want to experiment. I want to, I want to set myself up to lose every single day. I want to get punched in the mm. face because I'm only going to get stronger and smarter by diversifying content around things that I care about. I won't get bored. I can keep things interesting. And more importantly for me, I can serve individual people that need to solve a problem today creatively that nobody else wants to help because they won't get the views. So for me, that's kind of like part of my deal is that my YouTube channel is like a public library. It's not like going and see your favorite blockbuster film that weekend. How do you leverage other social networks then to bring traffic to your YouTube channel or to promote what you're doing? Because you're very active across the social web because I follow you and I've been, you know, watching what you're doing. I, I base it on the intention of relationships. I work distribution in, you know, and I make it natural. But I use the other social networks more to build relationships because I know that my content has value to people. They just may not know who I am or they may not care or they may not uh, trust me yet. So I use the platforms to build individual relationships. I don't use the platforms just as a distribution pipeline. I don't use them just to spam my YouTube videos and content. I use the platforms for themselves and use that and then I become a bridge to my content. Getting to know me means getting to know what I do and what I have to offer and then you could, you know, become a follower of mine or a fan or a friend or a colleague as a consequence of that. So I focus on the relationships first. In Twitter, I'm known to, and I tell people, it's like, here's why to follow me in other social media. You want to ask me questions in real time? Twitter's a really great place to do that. And in Periscope, I do Q&As almost once a week, sometimes two or three times a week if something interesting is going on. Facebook, Facebook is a great business networking platform for me it's like you know i'm not super excited about um you know random fans wanting to friend me on facebook you get a limited amount of facebook friends but if someone wants to talk business or has an opportunity or wants to work together on something that's where i like you know those relationships that's how we got to know each other and so i use it for that i participate in Facebook groups. If I have something of value to offer to the group, people know that I'm not just going to post a video selfishly to try to get views. My content by itself is designed to solve people's problems. So if I'm posting a video, it's because it solves that problem for someone in the group or for the group as a whole. So I'm given a lot of leeway by people who know me in these groups to do that kind of thing. And I'd say that that's something for people to consider is that you have to have permission on some level to interrupt people with your content. And if your content doesn't feel like an interruption and if it feels like it delivered value for the other person, that is going to be acceptable. They're not going to roll their eyes and click away. It's why we actually kind of are getting to a place where ads are much more difficult to stomach. And we'd rather you just if you're going to market your product to us, you're going to advertise your service to us, do it in the form of content and storytelling that we can consume. Don't make it an ad because we're just not as interested in that anymore. I love the Love is a Subaru campaign because it tells an interesting story that makes someone like me who's like, you know, a single guy, early 30s, like, wow, you know, I might buy a Subaru in my lifetime because I want a family and I'll be a soccer dad and then I want the Subaru because they told me the story. They sold me on 
that. So let's talk about monetization, because I know that's the question that all my listeners will want me to ask you about. What revenue potential or even revenue streams does your YouTube channel give you from, you know, AdSense, being hired to train people, speaking and consultancy based on now your um, higher brand profile? What has it done for you and for your business? Well, for me, it has, in my opinion, it has unlimited potential and it's helped me uh, grow a six-figure business, and not just in the YouTube um, ad sense, the sponsorships and the affiliate marketing, although those all do very well for me um, in terms of elevating my overall brand as an online educator, not just as a YouTube expert, but as somebody who knows social media, as someone who understands the language of branding, and more importantly, I'm a, I'm a content marketing expert and a video marketing expert more and beyond that I'm a YouTube expert because I understand how all the things interrelate. Not to mention that I know how to use, you know, unlike some people who are creators, I know all the technical aspects of the lighting and the camera gear and the editing programs and the recording, even some of the motion graphics stuff and Adobe After Effects. So I'm a hardware and software guy. So it allows me to have proven that by showing. And there's very few people who can tell you that they've shot, produced, and edited, and optimized, and marketed Mm -hmm. a thousand videos. That's a very specific credential to have. Not a lot of people could put that on a resume. So it's, it's elevated me as a subject matter expert and as a practitioner. It's allowed me to work with great clients, great brands. I've gotten to work with companies like Adobe and Dell and Lexar and Transcend and Samsung, uh, just to name a few. I've gotten to speak on great stages like Social Media Marketing World, um, it looks like I'm going to be speaking at Summit Live. I've spoke at How Design Live, um, and I'm doing some more speaking uh, engagements at new conferences this year as well. Uh, I got to speak last year at both Vlogger Fair, and I got to do a workshop at Adobe Max. And those are things that wouldn't have happened without the YouTube channel. Uh, I also am a paid writer with um, a few creative publications, Creative Pro, Print Magazine, How Design Magazine, um, among others. So uh, I've gotten published in a few magazines. This is what it allows you to do. It allows you to take your personal brand and you can elevate it to this huge level and you can reach people globally and you can get access to people and to brands. And it's just a vehicle. You could do that with a podcast. You could do that with a book. You could do that with a blog. Uh, you could do that with an Instagram account. For my skill sets and my personality, YouTube happens to be the right platform and the right fit that allows me to scale. But I could have, in theory, done this with another vehicle like a podcast or a digital magazine. And it's been done before. So I'm relatively new to vlogging. I've been ignoring YouTube for, for far too long. So I've decided this year I will commit to it. Now, you had a little look at JSB Talks Digital, the vlog. What can I do to improve my vlogging style? My 21-year-old daughter, Sophie, um, criticizes me weekly when she sees my vlogs. And she says, Mom, that's not really a vlog. So what can I go back and tell her that Roberto Blake says JSB is doing well? And what do I need to improve on? Well, there's a, there's a thing with the YouTube culture, especially for viewers, in terms of what they consider a vlog or what they consider a YouTuber. But what you're doing is closer to what the father who invented modern vlogging, uh, Zay Frank, uh, did. Gary Vaynerchuk, even uh, before he started doing his daily V, tremendous marketer, tremendous content guy, um, huge businessman. He, when he started Wine Library TV, that was done in the style of vlogging. The style of vlogging is talking directly to the camera and um, sharing your thoughts, and uh, it's a video log. It's almost like journaling, if you will, and talking directly to the, the camera. Your stuff is done more in the style of the Vlog Brothers. In fact, my YouTube channel is done in the style of vlogging, at least it's, a, it's in its origin and its roots. For young YouTubers, people under 20 and 25 and younger who watch YouTube and think about vloggers, they're thinking more in the vein of someone like Casey Neistat. Mm. They, that's what they're interpreting as vlogging at this point, and that's uh, a matter of genre 
versus style. Mm-hmm. Because you see, there's a genre of vlogging versus a style of vlogging. My genre is education. Someone else's genre could be business. Uh, it could be lifestyle. And your genre doesn't have to be vlogging for the style of the way that you shoot and edit your videos, the way that you produce to be vlogging. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's a matter of style versus genre. It's like you can film videos in the style of journaling and speaking directly to the camera, the way that you would kind of write a journal entry or the way that you would have a conversation because vlogging is just what was what you'd call video logging, which means in the same way that you would write a blog, what you were doing, if it was written, you could call yourself a blogger, right? Absolutely. So, so Sophie and I are going to continue this conversation this evening and I'm going to tell her exactly what Roberto Blake told me that, you know, it's my style, it's my genre. Finally, Roberto, what three top tips would you give established uh, vloggers or YouTubers who are trying to grow their community? Instead of focusing on virality, focus on search engine optimization. YouTube, before it's anything else, is a search engine. And it's becoming more and more of a search engine every time they tweak the YouTube algorithm. The YouTube algorithm determines the ranking and distribution of YouTube videos and is the bane of most YouTube YouTube creators' existence. For me, it's a tremendous gift because I come from the world of web development and design and marketing, which means I understand the algorithm. I understand it at a fundamental level, and it's not some evil, malicious thing that's out to get YouTubers the way they like to feel it is sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's there to serve a purpose for viewers predicated on interest and user behavior and a lot of other factors. And so what I would tell them is even the biggest YouTuber in the platform, PewDiePie, with over 50,000 subscribers, and no, I'm not like trying to call you out, Felix, and I think you're a great guy, but you are crap when it comes to SEO, my friend. You, you do not give the YouTube algorithm a lot to work with because – if you can't contextualize the relationship between someone's title, their descriptions, and then the keyword tags, that metadata, how do you expect a robot to say, hey, Roberto, you like this thing? Well, this thing is similar. It can't make that distinction because it's not going to watch your video. It only has text input data to go off of. What do you want this poor robot to do? So that would be my number one biggest thing. Uh, The second thing I would say is that understand that it's not quality over quantity. That's a naive um, point of view that starving artists love to perpetuate. YouTube, at its core, is a business. It's also a distribution platform, and thus quantity does matter once you have something of acceptable quality, meaning that I've figured out a, a method and production and a style and content that has an objective baseline of quality, mass producing that is smart. Once you find out what people will accept from you, you mass produce it from a business standpoint because inventory matters. I don't think that I could continue to grow my channel at the rapid pace that I do. I net maybe over 10,000 new subscribers, positive net subscribers, every single month and have for a good while now, which is why my rapid growth is taking place. And I couldn't do that if I didn't have like about a thousand videos out there uh, to market and promote and bring new people into my ecosystem. I get between 350 and 500 new subscribers per day. And that has to do with the fact there's a lot of ways to discover me in terms of content because I put out so much It's mostly evergreen, meaning that stuff that people can search from, uh, search for a year from now and find me and it still be relevant. How to buy your first camera is going to be relevant two years from now because it's not about what cameras are out right now. It's about everything you need to know before you buy one. So that's going to be relevant. Quick tips for buying a new laptop is going to be relevant a year from now. It's not going to matter that I shot it in 2016. So by having that content that could live on and solves a problem and answers a question, that's going to – and the thing is, even if you want to do – even if you want to be a vlogger and you don't want to talk about gear or tech or education, there are things in, on an emotional level that 
would still be interesting to people long term and could get searched or could get recommended by other videos that exist that people are interested in. So if you think about that and you think about the types of things that people will watch or that the people that you want to reach will watch, then that you know would matter. So I would say don't think quality over quantity. Think both is number two. And then number three, uh, uh, I think it leads into what I was just saying is have a discovery strategy. Have a strategy for how people find you, and when they find you, make sure you're delivering something that lets them know who you are, like what they see, and trust that you'll continue to deliver on that. Fantastic. Roberto Blake, it's been a pleasure. So much to think about, so much to work on. I am going to share your YouTube channel, your Twitter account, Facebook, Snapchat and Instagram over on my blog, digitaltraining.ie. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on JSB Talks Digital, but I'm sure we'll continue this conversation on social media and have a great day in North Carolina. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Shoutouts. My shoutouts in this episode go out to three YouTubers rocking it with social media and digital marketing content. It goes without saying that Roberto Blake is rocking it, of course. So I've chosen Jay Beer. Jay has produced a hit show, Jay Today, where he shares pieces of his marketing mind three minutes at a time. He recently ended that show, but the episodes are still worth watching on YouTube. He's planning a new show to come out soon, in which he says he will focus on a direct topic rather than just what's on his mind. The idea behind Jay Today. Jay Beer is a thought leader in the digital marketing world and he's in front of all social media channels. So tapping into his know-how is worth your while. Pat Flynn is also one to watch on YouTube. I mentioned him last week on the show in relation to podcasting, but he also vlogs about his podcast and also to complement the content on his blog, Smart Passive Income. Finally, I can't end shoutouts to YouTubers without mentioning Gary V. What would a YouTube list be without Gary? His YouTube channel is amazing and usually skews more towards motivation than it does actual marketing insights. But for solopreneurs and those in business, Gary V's gets us motivated day in, day out. And we also know how famous his videographer is following him around. Gary has the Gary V Daily Show, so make sure that you subscribe to it on YouTube and take time to watch out and see how other YouTubers are developing their style and how they're presenting their content. I, for one, as a new vlogger, will certainly be watching and learning. JSB's column. I recently started vlogging after ignoring YouTube for far too long. As I've mentioned before, YouTube is the world's second largest search engine after Google and Google owns YouTube. So if we're interested in optimizing our content on the social web, video will be our best friend. So let me share my vlogging story with you in the hope that you will learn something from JSB. Firstly, what should I call my vlog? A vlog is a video blog and I decided to go weekly. Well, as you know, this is episode 31 of the podcast JSB Talks Digital. And after some thinking time, I decided why not call my vlog JSB Talks Digital? After all, let's keep with the branding and keep it consistent. And that's exactly what I did. So I slightly edited the podcast logo to make it relevant for the vlog. My vlog goes out every single Monday on YouTube. Um, it is a big commitment to commit to a weekly vlog, but after seven months podcasting and committing to a weekly podcast, I thought that I should do the same with my video blog because the big C in content marketing, as I'm always preaching, is consistency. And to get any real traction, I decided I'd go weekly. When it comes to storytelling, it's at the heart of vlogging and at the heart of creating video. On my YouTube channel, I have created a number of playlists where I categorize my vlogs. So you have JSB's Digital Diaries, JSB Talks Digital, JSB's Digital Bytes, 
interviews and events. So for example, I recently attended the Pendulum Summit in Dublin over two days and I've created a whole playlist for the six video interviews that I undertook there. I also have created an intro and outro and also some section jingles for my vlogs, again, making sure that I'm consistently telling the same story and that people recognize and become familiar with my vlogs every week. When it comes to shooting and editing, I have two approaches. When I'm out and about at events, sometimes I'll take a videographer with me because I'm so busy running around interviewing people and talking to the camera that I don't want to be thinking about all the technicals. But when I'm sitting in my office or on the train or maybe in somewhere for a full day, I will actually use my own mobile phone. I have a tripod, I have my Zoom H1 for audio and I have my lapel mic. I outsource my editing to somebody who's much better at editing than me, and that's Steve from Vivify Multimedia. When it comes to promotion, my vlogs are uploaded onto YouTube, they're shared on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, Google+, and on LinkedIn, and I also send it to my 3,000 plus email list every single week. Sometimes I will do a promo for a longer vlog, maybe 10 or 13 minutes, and run that as a teaser on my Facebook profile, and on my Facebook page. And finally, as I'm a new vlogger with only six vlogs under my vlogging belt, I am willing to learn and to grow and to take advice from the experts and such advice as given to me by Roberto Blake. But as Mark Schaefer says, guys, if you're interested in starting vlogging, don't wait for perfect, get front of screen, give it a go. And the more you record, the more you shoot, and the more you will become more comfortable with your own style. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Digital Training Institute, and you'll get my vlog every Monday in your inbox. Social media tool of the week. Social media tools save time, time is money, and tools make you more effective as a marketer. Considering this week's show is dedicated to video marketing, then the tool that saved my working week is TubeBuddy. This tool encompasses SEO for video, bulk processing, and it's also a superb productivity tool. When you upload a video to YouTube and you have the TubeBuddy free browser extension integrated, it will run with your channel with ease. It runs automated checks to ensure you're following YouTube's recommendations, so it's almost like a best practice checklist. There are a ton of cool features in TubeBuddy that you will love. Here's just some of them. iCard templates, annotation templates, thumbnail generator, advanced video embeds, comment filters, welcome messages for new subscribers, featured video promotions, and uploading videos directly to Facebook. So if you're a vlogger or planning to be a vlogger, then check it out at tubebuddy.com. Thanks as always for tuning in to JSB Talks Digital. As always, I'll have everything discussed on today's show on my blog at digitaltraining.ie. To ensure you never miss an episode of JSB Talks Digital, make sure you subscribe on your smartphone on iTunes or Stitcher. You can also subscribe on SoundCloud. 20 minutes on a Friday can really keep your digital knowledge in shape. If you're interested in becoming a guest on the show or have an event you want to promote, simply drop me an email to joanne at digitaltraining.ie. If there's a topic you'd love me to cover, send me a tweet to at tweets by JSB. And you know, by this stage, I love Snapchat. I'm JSB Snaps. So I'm Joanne Sweeney Burke. This has been JSB Talks Digital. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon. JSB Talks Digital. Digital.